In this video, we'll be talking about the geometric distribution, and this is closely related to the previous stuff we've been talking about in that its parameter p is very related to the Bernoulli parameter p. Um, so let's just describe what this means. So a random variable x is distributed as geometric with parameter p, where p is between 0 and 1 inclusive, so it's a probability, uh, if its definition goes like this. So again, let's use, um, we can just stick to the cars example, that seems to be working well for now. So the cars example, if you didn't watch the previous videos, is you're living in the city that has uh, red and white cars, okay? And uh, let's assume that P is one half. So there's an equal number of red cars and white cars, and we'll assume there's a, an abundance of both. There's no shortage. So there's you can say there's infinitely many, a uh, very large number of both types of cars. Okay, so now uh, X is going to measure, let's say we're looking for white cars. X is going to measure how many cars have to go by before we see our first white car. Okay, so uh, what that means is pretend we just start observing. Uh, we just stand on the road and we start looking for cars, and a red car passes by. So we count that as one. Another red car passes by. We count that as two. And another red car passes by. That's three. And now we get a white car. So that's four. So X is four in that case. So it is the number of trials up until we get a success, which we define as a white car. And remember to count this last trial. Okay, so it's not three. It's four. It's You have to count the time you actually get a success. So now, um, given that experiment, and of course you can use other stuff, you can say this for coin flips, maybe the time until you get a, a heads or maybe a tails, if you're taking tails as success. Okay, so that's the basic description of the experiment, of the how we generate this random variable. Um, and let's just talk about the law. So we let's say we want to find the probability right now that x is equal to some k. Now, what does that mean? So of course we're going to have to have Let's just put this in right now, zero otherwise, because it, the actual thing will be up here and then this will just be all other cases. So uh, let's first think about what this means. So let's say we want k to be 4, like before. So when is, uh, when is x equal to 4? Um, that means we have to have three failures in a row. We have to have red car, red car, red car, and then on the fourth we must have had a white car. Okay, so how does that happen? So three failures in a row, since all these are independent of each other, that means we have the probability of a failure is actually 1 minus p, and if we have three of them in a row, that I would put a 3 up here. But since we have k in general, we have k minus 1 failures. So I'll put that up here. And then, immediately following that, we have a success. So multiply that by the probability of a success, which is p, and that's it. That's our clean uh, law right here. And of course, the last thing we have to do is put in what values k can be. So be a little careful here, because k, uh, we can't start at 0, because uh, well, mathematically, that would mean this exponent would be negative 1, and that would be a little bit weird. But more, uh, think about it intuitively. Um, if we're measuring the number of trials until we get a success, how could it be 0? Because that would mean we have no trials at all, and we've already got a success. That's not physically possible. So that means k is something in the set uh, from 1 to 3, all these integers, you can go up to infinity. Okay, so remember you don't include zero for this um, distribution right here. Okay, cool. So um, and that's it. That's the that's the law, and I'll write that right here. Um, so this is the PMF of the geometric distribution. Um, and now we can go ahead and do some computations. Let's compute the uh, mean uh, and variance of this guy. So we want to find, let's say, expected value of x. So we're going to do a little cool trick here that we haven't seen before, but uh, it could be useful for future. Um, calculations as well. So expected value of x is just by the definition we take over all values uh, that x could take and we have to write the law in here and we multiply that by k. Okay, So this is the definition of expected value as it occurs in this case and let's see we have to do some manipulations here to figure out what the sum actually is. So let me begin by pulling the lone p here out front. Okay, So I'll pull that out front and I'm left with inside a k and a 1 minus p to the k minus 1. Okay, what am I going to do with that? Uh, so we have to be a little creative here, and I'm going to tell you what to do. So you need to use the, uh, we're going to use a derivative here with respect to p. Because this kind of looks like it was, if we took the derivative of something, maybe we got this, right? Because let's say we want, um, if we had 1 minus p to the power of k, if we took the derivative of that, the k would come down, so derivative with respect to p, we take the k down, this k becomes a k minus 1, just as here, except chain rule says we have to put a negative here, so maybe we should put a negative here. So we see that if you take the derivative of this guy, you get exactly what's inside the sum right here. So let's go ahead and replace that, so we get p times sum from k equals 1 to infinity of d dp of, and this negative sign I'll just put out the front, which is fine, and I'll put 1 minus p 
to the power k inside here. Now, the sum of derivatives is the derivative of sums. Okay, so we're going to have negative p, and I'll take the derivative outside, and we'll have sum from k equals 1 till infinity of 1 minus p to the k. Now, this sum we can do, right? This is just a geometric series, um, because this 1 minus p is bounded between 0 and 1 inclusive, because p was uh, bounded between 0 and inclusive. Um, and so the geometric infinite geometric series formula tells us that this is equal to negative p d dp, uh, and then this is first term, which is 1 minus p over 1 minus the common ratio. So 1 minus 1 minus p, that gives us p. Okay. Um, so now we just need to take the derivative of this guy right here with respect to p, so we get negative p. Uh, this, we can use, um, we can actually use uh, quotient rule down here. So we can say bottom times derivative of the top minus top derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared if we want, and this p will cancel with one copy over here. And up here, what do we have? We have, um, we can apply this negative sign over here, so we actually get p plus 1 minus p, and we still have a p on the bottom, right? So this p cancels with this p. Final answer, 1 over p, okay? So the expected value of a geometric distribution is 1 over p, the 1 over the probability of success, okay? So just intuitively speaking, that means that if the probability of success, let's see if this makes kind of sense. If the probability of success is very, very small, let's say it's 0 0.001, okay? So 1 over 0 0.001, that's going to be very large. And does that make sense? Yes, because if the probability of success is small, we're going to have to do, on average, a large number of trials to get that success. On the other hand, if the probability of success was its maximum possible, let's say it's 1, that means we definitely have a success. We have to do, on average, one trial. And on average, actually, that means we always do one trial because as soon as one trial comes around, it's already a success, okay? So this is actually not a very interesting random variable, just equal to one in that case. All right, so now that we found the expected value, our next step is to find the variance of this geometric uh, distribution. So uh, let's, read, let's just write down the definition. So we want variance of x. That's equal to expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x squared. Okay, so this guy we just found was 1 over p squared, okay, remember the squared, and this guy we need to work on. Let's just write the definition of this guy first. So it's sum, k goes from 1 to infinity of 1 minus p to the k minus 1p, um, and then we have to put a k squared because it's x squared, okay? This looks a little bit nasty, let's, uh, what we'll do, we'll take out this p out here first, so we have p sum k equals 1 till infinity, 1 minus p to the k minus 1, k squared. Now we can't do our slick trick we did before because back then we had, uh, this squared wasn't here, so this looks like a derivative here because it's just 1 minus p to the k, take the derivative of that. But now since the squared is here, it kind of messes things up, but not to worry, once we have this key in sight, this one kind of uh, trick, everything else flows. So we're going to write k squared equals k squared minus k uh, plus k. And actually I think I'll rewrite this k squared uh, plus k minus k. Okay, and you might think that's stupid. Why did I just write that? Um, so this is because I want to write it as k plus 1 minus k. Okay, so this, I'm going to replace the k squared right here by this thing right here and break the sum into two sums. One that has this factor in the beginning, this k, k plus 1, and the other will have this factor of minus k. Let me do that now. So we have p, which is just staying out front. First sum goes from k equals 1 to infinity. Uh, 1 minus p to the k minus 1, and now I'm going to put this first factor, k, k plus 1, k, k plus 1, and this next sum will be um, minus sum, k equals 1 to infinity, of 1 minus p to the k minus 1, and it's going to be just a k in here, okay? So this minus sign I've put out here. Cool. Now, what do we recognize this as? This is exactly, um, if we take the p and multiply it by this guy, then this is exactly the expected value, right? Because it's p times 1 minus p to the k minus 1, which is the law, times k. So it's the expected value of x. And that we found was 1 over p. So this guy is really p times this first sum right here. So it's k equals 1 till infinity, uh, 1 minus p to the k minus 1, k, k plus 1, and all that minus 1 over p, okay? Because that was the expected value. Now this guy, we can actually represent it as a second derivative. So let me write the answer and we'll work backwards and show why that is the right answer. So this is, uh, let me put the negative 1 over p in the front so I don't have to keep putting this in the brackets. Minus 1 over p plus p uh, sum, let's say, k okay, equals 1 to infinity. Uh, we're going to do, this is going to be d squared, dp squared, uh, it's going to be 1 minus p to the power of k plus 1. Okay, 
and let's see why that's true. So we'll do a little marginal calculation up in the left hand corner up here. So what is the derivative, uh, second derivative of this? If we take the first derivative, you're going to get the k plus 1 come down. So it's going to be k plus 1, 1 minus p to the power of k, and don't forget the chain rule, put the negative here. We'll take the derivative again with respect to p, we're going to get minus k plus 1, the k will come down, we'll get 1 minus p to the k minus 1, use chain rule again, that becomes a positive. So it's k, k plus 1, 1 minus p, k minus 1. And that is exactly what we have right here. So we have represented this as a second derivative, which is cool. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to, again, take the derivative out, because the sum of derivatives is the derivative of the sums. It's going to be uh, minus 1 over p plus p d squared dp squared sum k equals 1 till infinity. 1 minus p to the k plus 1. Now this is great because this is just a geometric series that we know we saw how to do that expected value. So let's see, uh, what we'll do is minus 1 over p plus p d squared dp squared and the first term is actually when k equals 1 so the first term is 1 minus p squared over the common ratio which uh, 1 minus 1 minus p gives p on the bottom. Okay, let's take the derivative of this guy with respect to p, okay? So uh, let's do that on the next page because that will take a little bit of room. Okay, so we're going to take the derivative of that guy right now. So it's going to be one, negative 1 over p plus p. Uh, so we actually take the second derivative. So when you take the first derivative, we're going to get, uh, I guess we'll have to use, we'll use quotient rule again. So bottom times the derivative of the top um, minus the top derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Okay, we're going to have to take another derivative, but first let's clean up this a little bit so we don't have to suffer through that as much. Um, so this is negative p, uh, this is negative 2p plus 2p squared minus uh, 1 plus 2p uh, minus p squared all over p squared. Okay, interesting. So we're going to get minus 1 over p plus p d dp. Um, this minus, minus cancel, this becomes uh, p squared minus 1 over p squared. Okay, so the last thing to do is apply this one more time. Um, and let's do that. Minus 1 over p plus p. If we take the derivative again, we're going to use quotient rule again. Bottom derivative of the top minus top the bottom bottom squared. Okay, immediately this p will cancel with this become exponent of 3. Uh, let's see what else. No, we, all this left, this is all just algebraic manipulations at this point. So uh, we have a 2p cubed minus 2p cubed, awesome, uh, plus 2p. Okay, all over that p cubed. This will go away. It's going to be minus 1 over p plus this 2p over p cubed will become, this will become a uh, 2 over p squared. And so we'll do a common denominator of p squared, so this will become 2 minus p over p squared. Now remember, we're not done. This is just the expected value of x squared, okay? So in the variance calculation, we have found this term. So do not forget to subtract this term, because a lot of people, they'll do this long calculation, and since it was so long, they'll think they're done, and that's the variance. But remember to subtract this term. It's a super easy step. So subtract 1 over p squared from this result. So I will do that. 2 minus p minus 1 over p squared. This gives us 1 minus p over p squared, so whew, after all that work, there's a variance of a geometric uh, uh, distribution. Okay, next thing we'll do is find the moment generating function, which turns out not to be as much work uh, as this. So um, we want to find the MGF, right? So that's the expected value of e to the s x, and that by definition is sum k equals 1 till infinity. Uh, so it's going to be p, 1 minus p, k minus 1. Uh, e to the s k. Okay, so this looks a little bit scary, but let's just do a little bit of factoring out. k equals 1 to infinity. Uh, e to the s 1 minus p. Okay, I did a lot of steps at once, so I owe you explanation of that. So what I did, I took this p, I brought it out. Uh, I took this 1 minus p to the k minus 1, and I split it into two. I split it into 1 minus p to the k and 1 minus p to the negative 1. And the negative 1 came out here, okay? And the 1 minus p to the power of k stayed in there. And since it was e to the s to the k, I combined the e to the s and the 1 minus p to the k, and I put them together and raised them both to the k. Now this sum, again, once again, we recognize as a geometric series, right? Except now the common ratio is not 1 minus p. It's e to the s times quantity 1 minus p. Okay, so uh, let's go to the back 
of this page and we'll finish that off. So remember the first term is going to be e to the s 1 minus p. So first term is e to the s 1 minus p over the common ratio which is the same thing and that's all multiplied by the factors in the front which is p over 1 minus p is p over 1 minus p okay so uh, now we just kinda have to do some factorizations and we see the thing to do will be this 1 minus p and this 1 minus p will go away so we get a formula p e to the s over 1 minus 1 minus p e to the s um, I've always found this the hardest to memorize out of all of the moment generating functions because it's so it doesn't really have a natural form but if you can remember the derivation it should be a little bit easier to memorize and also there's a few caveats to go with this so notice when we use this geometric sum I I failed to mention that uh, remember when you do a geometric sum this has to be the absolute value of the inside term the common ratio has to be less than one and since this is positive e to the s is positive one minus p is positive this just has to be less than one so we need we got to have that e to the s 1 minus p is less than 1, so just solving for that we get that uh, e to the s has to be less than 1 over 1 minus p, therefore s has to be less than natural log 1 over 1 minus p. Okay, and if it's not, we're going to start getting negative or non-defined results for this guy, and we can't get a negative for this guy because the expected value of something positive, this is always positive, right, it can't be negative. So remember, keep that in mind, and when you do this, s has to be less than that, okay? Uh, cool, so that's the MGF and geometric distribution. The only last thing we need to do about this is really draw a little graph and look at what's going on. So if we draw a graph of the PMF, so here is K and here's probability that X equals K. For simplicity in this graph, we're going to assume that P is going to be a half. Okay, so our law is just given by uh, P 1 minus P to the K minus 1. And since P and 1 minus P are both a half, this is 1 half to the K. Okay, that's the probability that x is equal to k. So um, we'll put 1 here, we'll put 2 here, we'll put 3, 4, so on. And the first term up here, since the first thing we plug in here is going to be 1 half, we'll start this as 1 half, this will be 1 fourth, this will be 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, and so on. So when we put 1 in here, we get a half. When we put 2 in here, we get half squared, which is a fourth. So we see every time we plug something in, it's getting divided by 2. So we get this kind of uh, graph right here. And if we, again, remember as in the previous video, we're, we can't connect the dots because they're, it's not defined between these values. But let me just draw the dotted line showing kind of what the trend is going to be like when we have a large number for k when, when you're looking at it from far away. It's going to go like that. So it's, it's called the geometric distribution because, uh, because of this property it has. Because when you have uh, one, two, three, when every time you increase by one, you kind of divide by a factor uh, going down. So that's kind of how it looks compared to the other distributions, if that helps uh, visualize a little bit. So this is a pretty cool distribution. It will come back to it, actually, when we talk about the exponential distribution, which is kind of a continuous analog of this guy.